Now we're ready to start the smallmouth bass. I've gathered all of my reference materials um, from the photos that I took of the uh, bass that I caught this summer. I have uh, drawn or, compi or compiled a working drawing that I can use now to make my templates. And I'm actually ready to start laying these out on a block of wood. Now let me explain the templates and what I've done to them. The side view, one of the more um, tedious problems I have when I'm doing fish are getting the, uh, well, for example, the operculum here, uh, getting that registered from side to side so that when you look down on top of the fish, you can see that they are equal or registered even if the the fish is turning slightly it doesn't doesn't look completely out of symmetry so and and getting the fins registered or the body the same from side to side so what I do so you can see it better here is I cut out areas that I can trace through the template and this allows me to register details on both sides of the carving block as we'll see later now I find it much easier when I'm carving my fins. For example, the pelvic fins and the pectoral fins. I put both of them on one piece of wood and I carve both of them together. Then I carve them apart and the last thing I do even after I've textured the fish so I can texture scales and so forth under these scales is um, to uh, mount the, the fins, the pectoral and the pelvic. Now the spiny dorsal, the soft dorsal and the caudal fin and the anal fin I leave on the fish when I cut it, cut the blank out as you'll see. And this area right here is here is where the uh, the pelvic fins go and the um, the uh, pectoral fins will go in here after. So let's get started. I'll cut out my blank and we'll start from there. Okay, I have cut out the blank for the body of my bass along with the pectoral fins, one on either side with a, uh, a piece in the middle that uh, one side to the other provides an excellent handle to um, while you're carving each of the fins and my pelvic fins. So now I'm ready to start. As usual, as with the other projects, I'll begin by drawing a center line following the curvature of, the, uh, of how I want the body of the fish. So I want him in an S configuration and that's how I've cut the blank. So I want to keep my center line generally in that configuration. Now I've drawn my center line all the way around the fish and in the S configuration that I want. Now I'm going to start transposing detailed uh, lines on there, detail lines rather, uh, that will allow me to uh, draw in the that beautiful torpedo shape of the fish's body, the operculum, the um, um, the pectoral fin slot because I'm going to be leaving I'm going to be leaving a little mound right here so that once I get the pectoral fin carved I can just insert it into a slot in that mound as you'll see this comes later so I'll start doing this give me just a second because it takes time and I would advise you to take time and check from side to side as you're doing this to make sure that these lines are not only accurate on the one side but perfectly matched on the other. Now there's a start. That's all I need and I can complete the rest. So allow me to get this done and we'll proceed from there. Okay, now I'm just finishing up putting my detail lines in and I've drawn all the other detail that I need. 
Um, this kind of looks like a knockout fish. I always put an X because that reminds me of the eye and how I want it and it allows me, the X shape allows me to go from side to side. Now you may notice on the top of the fish that there are lines that run across. Those I have tried to put in at a 90 degree angle to the center line which allows me to put for example the um, a part of the uh, gill plates in there, the operculum and the preoperculum and all of that. Plus it also allows me to register the eyes more accurately from side to side. Now let's take a look at this for a minute. Here I have the outline of the body and this area right in here is called the caudal peduncle. That's the mound that actually feeds into the tail or the caudal fin as it's called. And that's very important when we're doing scales later on because when we're sizing these scales, please stay aware of the fact that all the scales are not the same size on a fish. And they have quite a radical change in the area of the, uh, uh, where the, the caudal peduncle and the, and the caudal fin itself join. The larger scales come up to a point uh, just shy of the end and then they get smaller and smaller. And that's something you want to stay aware of, uh, as, of course, for realism. And then on the operculum, and the gill covers uh, all through here, we'll deal with this later, but if these scales on this uh, size of fish were like a quarter inch, up here they would be like a sixteenth of an inch in here. So stay aware of that and refer often to your references so you, you get as realistic a carving as possible. Now you'll see on the top, in the area of the dorsal fin, in where the I'm going to waste away all of this area here, this area here, and this is the spiny dorsal right here. I have to carve each one of these little spines in there, and on this fish, on the uh, spiny dorsal proper, there are nine, and a tenth one resides embedded in the soft dorsal. Now, the reason we call them spiny and soft I'll show you in just a second, but let me continue here. Uh, here you'll see this odd shape around my center line. That is the curve that I want and the amount of stock that I want to leave for the fin. I want this uh, fish because he, the S uh, shape of the body tells me that the fish is in motion or about to go in motion. So these fins are going to be working. Well, they're not going to be straight up and down as does the, um, the spiny dorsal stay just because the spines hold it more erect. These are the soft rays uh, uh, fin, soft rayed fins rather, and they move and flow in just a, a beautiful way that allows you to do some tremendous uh, movement appearing uh, things with this fish. Now the same thing applies to the tail. The center line of this whole mass that I cut out would go through here. But I want this tail to look like the, the fish has just started to move, part of the tail is recovering, and the other is kind of still in a power stroke. So I want this S shape, and you'll see that carved in later. So that generally, and, I'm, and I've done the same thing on the anal fin. Now the anus on the fish is right before this, uh, this fin, and that's why this is called the anal fin. All of this here is going to be taken out on both sides, leaving me this. Now again you can see by the center line that the fin itself is going to start at the center line or the line of the fish's body come up, curve out one way and curve the other. It'll be uh, like a clam shell on this side and a hollow clam, si uh, clam shell on this side telling you the observer that this uh, uh, fin has gathered water and is being used for a power stroke. So now I'm going to start relieving away all of the um, excess wood that I don't, and I haven't drawn uh, many crosshatch lines in here because it's 
fairly obvious from this line to this line that this is what has to come out and I know I have to follow this. I'm going to be using a safe end cylinder uh, typhoon bit, quarter inch shaft, and rather than start in here somewhere, you want to start at the top and begin following these lines right here, but from time to time keep your eye here so you don't override this line here, because this is a beautiful line of this torpedo body that you're, gonna, you're going to um, shape into a nice smooth look and you don't want to cut down in here and have any lumps because this is a nice straight line although it has humps in it or a hump. So let's get started relieving away our uh, our waist area and we'll get this fish shaped. Alright I've assembled all the fin photos and the overall photo of the bass is that you can partially see here to keep me in line while I'm carving and shaping while I'm wasting away and rough shaping the uh, the fins and uh, and the body as you'll see in a few minutes so let's get the air going and I'm just going to start roughing away and I'll show you general strokes uh, for this particular sequence, the only bit I've used is this smooth end cylinder, which I like very much because it has reach for anywhere I want to go on this fish carving to remove any of the wood that I want to remove. Now you see as I'm cutting, thanks to that beautiful smooth end, I'm not cutting into there, and this is a new bit, so a little bit of the, the uh, paint that they use is wearing off, but it, it helps you to see it even better. Now I'm keeping track of where I'm going here. Now this was an easy part right here. If you notice, I'm working with the grain, so the wood's coming off a lot easier. I'm beginning to work down there. Now where I've got to be careful with this, is coming around this end because the grain in this fish runs this way and if I start in here it could chatter and actually tear down into the fish or even worse go down into my fingers. So what I'll do is start forward where I'm still working more with the grain and I'll begin cutting down now to my body line. See, I'm keeping track by turning it from side to side, but I also want to keep this fairly squared because it'll be easier, easier for me to, to round this body by squaring it out than it will be, uh, as I've said before, than trying to round it from one side and then go round to the other side. Now, I'll go ahead and finish this. Uh, I'll leave you for a minute, but before I go, I want to suggest that when you're doing this other side, don't try to do it like this. You still want to preserve the thickness of the fins all the way through so that you can shape them later. So, in order to accomplish this now, now this side's even going to be a little easier because we got less stock to deal with and we'll start with the high side of that dorsal, or the soft dorsal, and begin working back. Now, Again, you've got to use some care here. You want to observe that body line as we go down. So as I said, I'll leave you. I'll work through this a little bit. I'm going to shape the tail. I'm going to uh, relieve away all the fins that are existing on this carving, on, the, on this blank. And then I'll round the body a little bit. And then I'll be back to you. Now, I've done all the shaping, as I said while we were away from each other. I've put that S shape into the tail. All of this was accomplished with that smooth end uh, typhoon cylinder. I've even outlined the caudal peduncle and the, and the caudal fin. I've even rough shaped in here and with the tip of it, by dragging it this way, I have begun to hollow these fins that I talked about. Now I want this fish to look like he's just 
going in this manner and I try to visualize all right if he did this movement with his body what would happen with these fins well I like the tail because that's visually uh, uh, sound for me but I had some uh, at first a problem deciding how I wanted the soft dorsal and the anal fin and I decided he's made a stroke like this which is going to fold these softer fins over this way so the rounded part will be um, this way uh, down and the the other side will be the cupped side uh, I say this way I mean that clam shell outer shape and the hollowed clam inner shape I've uh, narrowed out my spiny dorsal and I've shaped through the head now obviously when I shape through the head as you can see I've done this is going to be rounded off and I'm, I'm, I've, I lose all of this detail. So in order to reestablish this detail, I simply take my, my side template and register all the marks that I had. And there will be a, a vestigial um, uh, amount of line left in areas and you can just register it with what's there and reestablish all the detail you want here. Now on the head, you want to be very, very cognizant of how this fish's mouth is shaped. What is, what is it that's in here? You don't need to know all the parts of the operculum or the operculum uh, mass or the, their names, but what you do need to know are their shapes and how they apply to the particular fish that you're doing. What about the shape of this? If I look at this fish, can I tell that it's a large mouth bass or a small mouth bass? Well, based on what I've, on the uh, upper maxillary area here, what I've put in here on a small mouth bass, this section of that upper lip, let's call it, goes through the center of the eye, which tells me that this is a small mouth bass. If it were a large mouth, this part of the lip would be clear behind the eye. And that is about the only distinction as, uh, while I'm carving that I'd be able to tell or immediately whether this was a large mouth uh, or a small mouth as far as species go. I've drawn my X's, I've put circles around them and located them. Now I'm ready to start putting in the eyes and start carving in all this detail here. So let me prepare, I'll get my bits out, what I'm going to use as I did with uh, the rabbit and with the mallard. Uh, in setting any eye, I use a ball bit to uh, establish the eye cavity, that nice concave hole that fits my eye. I've left the eyes, I will be leaving the eyes rather, in the bag. Uh, the plastic bag so that they fit in and out. Now with a bass's eyes um, you want to remember and this uh, I probably won't be verbally covering with you because I'm going to leave you while I put the eyes in because uh, I follow exactly the same steps as I did in the eye, uh, eye setting sequence but the bass's eyes are more they're plumb to begin with but on the bottom part of the eye there is like almost the absence of any eyelid at all whereas on the top there is a fleshy mass that's called the sclera that allows his eye to flex up and down this way uh, and a fish's eyes don't move as ours do this fish can look down on his left side and look up on his right side and I have hundreds of photos that prove this along with uh, you know ichthyology uh, observations from you know from other folks to further what I was talking about as far as the uh, bass's eyes go if you look here's the eye proper and look over the top of this eye, even on this photo, uh, and you'll see this fleshy mass here that joins the top of the eye. This is called the sclera, and as I say, when you carve, and when we model, when I model in, as you'll see uh, when I finish this project, uh, the sclera will be very evident as it is on the fish itself. Now I'm beginning to form the mound 
that I will be slipping my uh, pectoral fin into after I get it carved. So I want to depress this I'm just going to let it roll back out into the body. Now even when I do a little tiny short stroke like this, you notice my thumb is still engaged, is still engaging rather the, the uh, blank just so I don't be slipping out. Okay, there's that little cut I'm going to need and I can, uh, I can improve this or enlarge it, do whatever I want later. But by shaping it now, I have it located and I know I won't be uh, mislocating it later on. Now I'm going to start by using a drag stroke. I'm going to outline this. Now, in this area, I want to leave this mounded up because both these sides, as you'll see after, is a, um, are a whole lot of arches. And these are called the bronchiostigal, bronchiostigal arches. Yeah, I, I even had to remember how to say it. So I'll start outlining this. And all I do to outline these is take this flame shape, drag along the line, and relieve away the shape that I want, then come back after and waste away where I've relieved. Now, these are kind of stacked one on the other, so I can keep relieving like this. And it doesn't take a great deep cut, as you can see, to uh, confirm, if you will, the shape of the operculum area here. Then I'm going to go on, cut in my eyes, cut in the lips, and I'll come back to you in a few minutes. Now I've finished the detail uh, and the shaping of the body and the smoothing of the fins. Now when I smoothed this uh, fish out, I used a a, a cylinder, a sanding cylinder on a mandrel and I smoothed out here, smoothed out here, I smoothed all the way around here. Because this thing sticks out you want to use a little caution here. I'd like to show you how to load a tapered split mandrel. This little mandrel right here is probably one of the more important sanding devices to sanding feathers, uh, feather groups, uh, jowls on the sides of heads, or just general sanding. The beauty of it is once you see it's loaded, you'll see where you can actually steer the sandpaper within a groove. The sandpaper will actually follow the groove and we'll be using this later on when we do other sequences so you'll see it in action. But I wanted to show you how to load this um, to begin with. Now, what we need are a pair of sharp scissors. Please don't get these from your beloved sewing box. She gets very upset when I cut sandpaper with her sewing scissors. And you need cloth-backed sandpaper. The paper back doesn't work well at all. Use the cloth back. You need a template to cut the uh, sandpaper to size and you need uh, any kind of super glue. So we'll begin by cutting the, uh, the size that we need from the template. Now, if you notice the template, and I'll refer to this from time to time, the template, I made this particular one out of a piece of aluminum flashing, has a right hand corner. That's very important that you not only maintain this when you cut it out, but you keep the right hand corner for a right-handed carver, you keep it to your right hand. To a left-handed carver, you keep it to your left hand. Um, because I'm right-handed and I cut this the same way every time, the grit has to be a certain way when you use the template to cut your sandpaper. So I marked grit, hopefully you can see that, on top of this. So it's always a reminder to me, I've got to use this 
with the grit up on this and the grit up on my sandpaper. So now I'll just place that. Here's the grit. Here's the grit up on my template. I'll place that against the sandpaper and I'll use my old non-sewing shears to cut them out. You'll have to pardon me, I have to switch positions here from time to time. And now I've got the shape that I need. There's my right angle corner and there's the, uh, the long point that I'll actually wrap down around my mandrel. So I'll set this aside. Now I'll take the mandrel and if you feel there's a stiffness to the um, sandpaper, run it a, two ways across the edge of a table. Um, let me get a block of wood and I can show you here. Make believe this were the edge of the table. I would hold it like this and run it down. You see this crease right here? What it's doing is breaking the bond but not loosening the grit. And then run it the other way and you can see how it it goes as it goes over the edge. All it do, does is condition the paper. Again, I, it's a misnomer to call it sandpaper when we're using a cloth back. Then here's my right angled corner and I'm holding my split mandrel and I run that into the mandrel so that I've got kind of a flag here. Now I try to keep it even to begin with. What I want to do when I'm done wrapping this is have this point down here at the bottom so that I can take one drop and I repeat one drop of super glue and set it under this tip once I've wrapped it. So let's start wrapping and I'll squeeze here and actually squeeze tight against the mandrel and roll with my right hand while I'm pinching so to, yes pinching with my left hand and I'm pinching that quite tightly and I will roll that, continue to roll it until I end up and there's my tip down here at the bottom where it belongs and the mandrel now is all loaded. Now all I have to do is take my super glue and put a drop in here but before I do that let me say this if you roll this and your tip be comes way down here you have an option. You can either cut that tip off even with the back of, of the mandrel or the back of the existing sandpaper or you can unroll the whole thing and adjust this by slanting the mandrel on the paper itself one way or the other and then re-roll and it may take a couple of times and once you've done this a couple of times you'll find it's much easier for you to judge and much easier for you to load. I use these with from uh, 100 grit to 200 grit sandpaper and I usually load two or three of them at a time so I don't have to stop when I'm carving to uh, load the mandrel. Now I'll just put a little drop of super glue on here. Now when I say a little I mean exactly that. It doesn't take much at all like that's way too much. Now why I mention this and why I did way too much you think I didn't plan that. When I close this off and hold it the excess glue is going to my finger so the whole thing will be stuck there. So that's I want to make the point here as little glue as possible to hold it. Now there is the result of too much glue. Thankfully, I can peel it off, but I'm still ready to go. After I sanded the tail and the body proper with this large sanding sleeve, I had to reach in around here to get a smoothness on the, on the fins and where the uh, body meets the fin. This is that uh, split tapered mandrel that we loaded 
and you'll see just how beautiful. You see, there's nothing but a wrap of sandpaper right here and the mandrel ends about a quarter of the way back. As this gets warmer, see I can reach in there and do any number of things. Where I want to go around this fin, for example, I can go like this and actually you can see as it gets warmer it steers itself. It's, it's almost like it's flexible to go through that. And that's what makes this such a, a beautiful little uh, unit to use where you have rises like in here. See, I can follow that and the configuration of that split mandrel allows me to do it and smooth it out as I go. Then I can reach back here and really not only partially shape but smooth smooth this down in preparation for putting my uh, my uh, caudal fin uh, the, the soft rays in even to smoothing surfaces like this and this works is it's a beautiful thing to use for uh, outlining feathers and uh, uh, smoothing feathers after you've outlined them and raised them away before we begin to carve the detail in the fins, I'd like to explain what the fins are and, and how I go about carving what their detail is. The front uh, dorsal or spiny dorsal on a smallmouth bass is composed of nine and a tenth one uh, on the soft dorsal of spines. These are extremely sharp as you would know if you had grabbed one of these fish. As a matter of fact some carvers cut these out completely when they're cutting the initial blank out and they use toothpicks that they stick into the fish and glue or um, thorn apples uh, make excellent uh, spikes and then they fill in between them with tissue paper, a very uh, uh, high grade tissue like we use, used to use on stick and tissue airplanes. Now the soft dorsal as opposed to spiny rays has soft rays and this is what they're called soft rays and if you notice each one of these emanates from a ridge before it splits and there's a depression there and there's a matching one on the other side of this uh, uh, fin and this it joins back into the body with a slight flare and then as it comes out here it splits into anywhere from four to six uh, little hair-like protuberances it looks almost like a uh, like a flat broom and this is what you've got to carve to make this a realistic looking fin. Each one of the soft rays as it comes out of the, the various fins comes off this ridge and then splits as I said before into anywhere from four to six or even eight um, hair like uh, sections. What happens when I carve this, I carve this groove that's starting from the body down here comes out, I'm sorry, the groove comes out and then comes to a point. Each groove comes to a point as you can see on, on this. See how this comes out and it comes to a point because these splits flare out. I hope there's not a great glare on there. So that's what, how I'm going to accomplish this and keep this this whole shape of the, the dorsal, the pectoral, the anal fin and, and the, uh, the uh, pelvic fins in mind as I do this and you'll see how they take shape. Okay, I've started to lay these out for you and I'll show you these. Uh, if you notice on the photo where the split comes at a pretty much of a, at a particular area and it's about a third of the way down the dorsal fin. Now when I started to carve these I had these uh, the um, spines drawn in on, on the flat fin and then I
And then all I did was lay the flame shaped bit, the ruby carver, beside it and drag stroke up. Not only on the right side of the leading uh, spine, but the leading edge of the following spine. On each side, and I made a drag stroke. It's much easier to show you the action of the bit and the, what the bit actually did, or what the stroke actually did, by not starting the machine. So I'll just trace this through. See, first I want. Then, when I had these two outlined, I just rolled in between to clean out the majority of the wood. Then I took a ball bit and actually turned the fish sideways and just cleaned from one to the other. Cleaned all the excess that I want to, leaving the spines relatively round and formed on both sides. Now, I did essentially the same thing on the soft dorsal fin as I would on the anal fin and, and the pectoral and uh, pelvic fins and the tail to get that groove where there are soft uh, fin rays all I did was draw in the center of the fin ray and then take a ball and trace in between them so that I got this type of groove appearance and then all I had to do was go back to my flame shape ruby carver or you can even accomplish this with a um, a uh, round nose bit uh, ceram cut a blue stone and just set it in here roll set it here roll 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 back and lift it out so you get a V shape where the soft ray begins to split now to finish the detail uh, of the um, soft fin rays, the splits on the end, I'm going to use a skewed wood burner. Uh, I've already checked to make sure that it isn't going to overburn. I've set my uh, burn power and I want to establish this split look at the ends and the, or at the tips of the uh, the soft fin rays. Now I'm using a skew uh, wood burning pen, and what I'm doing these inverted Y's or these uh, upside down V's that compose the tips of the soft rays on the fin. I'm first making the outline of the V where it meets the ray in front of it and then the other side of the V where it meets the ray behind it then I'm reaching back into the first split and dividing that and then reaching right beside it and dividing that whole V into fours. Now if I want to make it elongated the, the, uh, the trunk of the Y slightly elongated down that ridge that I've made I can go back and, and elongate it by just touching and coming back. This is roughly the shape of the soft rays. I have the ridge that emanates from the body that splits once and then splits again into fourth and then sometimes even splits again into sixes. So that's essentially the basics to carving the soft ray fins all the way around the fish. Before we establish the size of the scales uh, and put the lateral line on and, and uh, work from there, I just wanted to catch up on the detail that I worked into the head of this fish. Uh, I've already somewhat addressed the, the, the mandibles and the operculums, but I wanted to show you underneath, these are those bron bronchiostical rays, and on this particular fish I believe there are six of them and this is just part of his breathing system the gill system but they're very important when you uh, put them on a on a fish for realism if you look right in here and this is a beautiful place to show just a dab of color on this fish right in here is just a little bit of that beautiful red gill sticking out and we'll when it comes time to paint this that'll make this fish stand out that if you when you look underneath you'll see uh, this red.
So I wanted to show you this detail. Now let's establish the lateral line. Now the lateral line is this minuscule little line that runs along the side of the fish that starts at the gill plate and goes all the way back to the tail or the caudal fin. Now this is a sensory line. The fish pretty much hears with this. He can sense splashing, uh, whatever, but it's, it's the closest thing to an ear um, that I can describe. I'm sure an ichthyologist would uh, uh, describe it in greater detail, but I want to just show you the form of it and how I apply it to the fish when I'm laying out for scaling. Now, I'm going to put the, based on my uh, drawings here, I'm going to start by putting my lateral line in, and I, what I like to do is just put it in, draw it in in different, uh, put dots in or marks in different places, and bring it, I bring it on this fish right into the center of the tail. So, and now I'm just going to start drawing that in. just to initially give me a rough idea where that lateral line runs. Now, when I want to decide what I'm going to use for scale size, I'm going to refer to my, um, for, to my reference books for one thing and to um, um, photos, but I'll also refer to my center line and I'll go from the center line down. And as I recall, on this particular size, on this particular fish, there are 12 rows of scale from the center line on top down to the lateral line. And there are some 21 to 22 rows of scales from the lateral line down to the uh, forward part of the anal fin. Now I, I have to go back and look this up because I'm doing this from memory, but I do know on this particular fish I have discerned that I need a quarter inch scale for the main body, for in this area I need uh, not only quarter inch scales but I have to go down into the size as small as a sixteenth and in the caudal fin area I'm going to transition from a quarter inch to an eighth down even in, in smaller to a sixteenth. Um, this is something that you should pay great attention to when you're putting your scales on. Um, don't be afraid to um, look at uh, photos, but if at all possible, please uh, take it from a live fish or, or a, a, I mean a dead fish or a, any fish proper. Uh, what I do when I catch a fish, if it's one I'm going to keep and eat uh, so I don't hurt it, I will, uh, so I don't, um, I won't do this, what I'm trying to say is what I don't do this to a live fish because if I wipe the live fish with a coarse rag, it wipes off the uh, protective slime that's on the body. Uh, and then if I were to release the fish, he's subject to disease and ultimately death. But on a fish that I'm going to consume, that I have killed, I wipe the fish all down, as dry as I can with an old washcloth, something that's coarse. And then I lay tracing paper over the fish itself. Then I take a long piece of lead uh, on a pencil with a soft, soft lead, and I rub it over the tracing paper in areas of the fish where I'm concerned with scale size and by rubbing that it's almost like they do with gravestone markings I get the outline and the size of the scales and this is really the most accurate way to do it then when I'm ready to put my scales on I select the size that I need the size of scaling pen that I need from the size that I've already taken off the the, the real fish I've laid out a couple of uh, uh, scale burning pens here just so you can see the configuration of the pens themselves. I'll be using this quarter inch size, this one eighth and another sixteenth that I have in there. No, the sixteenth and, and the one eighth. And I was trying to remember before so I got out my reference here so I could show you again. There are twelve to thirteen scale rows 
above the lateral line from the center of the dorsal fin back and 20 to 21 scale rows from the center of the stomach back up to the lateral line. Now, once I get my scale, my lateral line drawn in, I'm going to divide it into scale size, which will also help me get a control um, on, uh, on uh, putting the scales on with a wood burner. And there are 69 to 77 scales along the lateral line of a small mouth bass. Now that leaves you quite a bit of lateral. You've got, um, what, eight, eight scale spaces to play around with and still say it's realistic. So let's get started. I'm going to lay out my lateral line and then I'm going to burn my lateral scales along it. And remember that a lateral scale has a split in it, a sensory bar and the scale will look like this and have a little uh, line in it like that. That's what shows these scales to be the lateral line because all the other scales are going to be just half rounds and and this is how I'm going to be laying them out on the fish as I go. I'll lay out and you always start from the front and work to the rear when you're scaling for the most part uh, and then I'll lay a, a lateral scale and I'll lay the uh, common scales next to it to give me spacing to register my next lateral scale and I'll do this all the way down that lateral line that I've drawn. Burning all these scales and to proper size on the fish is going to require quite a bit of time. I'm going to start by showing you the initial layout that I use and then I'm going to leave you and when I come back hopefully I'll have all the scales burned in place. Okay I've started uh, burning. I, my method of burning scales is to first burn along the lateral line. Um, there are 69 to 77 uh, scales on the lateral uh, line of a smallmouth bass. I've laid them out so I have 72. I feel quite safe at that number. And I lay the lateral line out on each each dot that I've made along the lateral line which allows me to go back and set in and burn a scale just off set of center. I have to get down here because I'm off center myself. There we go. Now I'm going to go along here and burn all of these of this particular size. Now this is a quarter inch uh, burning pen that is manufactured by Leisure Time. Uh, it's the Detail uh, Master Excalibur uh, burning unit and I wanted to explain that once I get all the lateral line scales in to establish that as the lateral line uh, we'll go back to those little splits that I uh, told you were in there earlier and I'll just take a skew and I'll touch each one along the lateral line which establish that little split and when the fish is all done you'll be able to see the lateral line where I've begun to establish it. Now I'm going to leave you and I'm going to finish all burning all my scales, put in all my uh, soft rays, uh, spiny rays. Uh, I'm going to carve uh, my pelvic and uh, pectoral uh, fins and I'll, I'll even finish those off and install them in the slots and install my eyes and then I'll come back and we'll talk about the completed fish. As I said earlier on most fish it's much easier to cut out the pectoral and pelvic fins in pairs and carve them separate of the main body blank. All other fins, the dorsal, caudal, and anal fins are cut as part of the body carving block since they are in line with the body and are fully exposed as part of the body outline in the side view. 
It's also easier to mount the pectoral and pelvic fins completely carved and detailed once the body has been completely carved and detailed. An easy way to accomplish carving the pectoral and pelvic fins is to cut them in pairs as shown in the sketch, leaving a section of waist stock between them that will create a handle that makes it easier to hold the paired fins as they are carved and textured at either end of the fin blank. Once the fin pair templates are drawn, I actually glue the templates to the carving block, then cut them out on the bandsaw. I use stock thick enough to resaw two or more paired fin blocks in case a fin is ruined while carving it to thickness or when I'm shaping it. The extremes of the fin details are drawn on the block in preparation for rough shaping. The individual fin shapes are relieved away with a large coarse flame shaped ruby and or a small typhoon flame shaped burr depending on the size of the fin you're carving. Consider the shape of the fin as you will want it to come out of the body of the fish. As an example, depending on the curvature of the fish's body, you may want more curvature for one pectoral fin than the other or the tip of one fin to be positioned out away from the body further than its mate on the opposite side of the body. Once the fins are shaped to your satisfaction, draw the fin ray details on both sides of the fins. Then shape the ray shafts with a narrow flame shaped ruby and or a ball shaped stone bit. Finish the fins by wood burning the split ends of each ray with a skewed wood burning pen. As each fin is removed from the central holding stock on the block, leave a small wedge of stock at the base of each fin. I use a small flame shaped ruby bit to cut away the fins and shape the wedge at the same time. This wedge will eventually be glued into a matching groove that is carved into the desired position on the body. As may be seen earlier on this CD, the locations and extremes of the fin base grooves were carved as the body was being shaped. But some final fitting will have to be done once the fins are finished and ready to be fit to the body. You should determine the angle and depth you want for each fin's final position. A small flame shaped ruby carver is the best bit to accomplish shaping the groove to the fin wedge. Once the fins are properly fitted, glue them into place with a five minute epoxy type glue. To accomplish a realistic appearance, be attentive to your working sketches and reference photos with respect to the manner and shape that each fin assumes as it leaves the fish's body. There. Now we've completed not only all the soft rays, burning all the soft rays, we've sharpened up the spiny rays in the dorsal fin and where they exist in the anal fin and I've shaped the pectoral and um, pelvic fins and I've inserted them in place so you can see there's even still a little bit that I have to clean up here and all the size scales that I want for this particular fish uh, both on the body, the caudal peduncle, the, uh, the operculum or the cheek area and I've set the eyes. I've put the nostrils in as you can see and that was done with my f small flame shaped diamond bit and all you do is plunge it and then make a little moon crater around it and then in front of it is a hole and the water goes in and out through when this fish is using his nostrils. So there you have it, there's the completed smallmouth bass. I'd like to turn him around so you can see the detail that we've worked into it. Uh, you can see very clearly that lateral line. It may be a little more pronounced but when I paint this fish with an airbrush I can fool the eye into believing that perhaps there wasn't a mistake here or a mistake there. Now once I've finished the, the fish and I've got everything the way I want it, 
Sometimes when you're burning, the tips of the scales will really rise away and make the fish look unnatural, more Neanderthalic or, or uh, prehistoric rather. So what I do is I take a bristle brush, which is, uh, which are, is a stacked uh, plated bristles that go on a mandrel, and at a slow speed, I'll start touching against that and knock the edges as you can see the white part that's appearing on the scales that I've burned. And it brings it down and makes the fish look a lot more natural. And this is one area where actually it's a little easier just to rub it on because I I'm, I'm, don't have to use my uh, uh, thumb fulcrum because it's a very light touch and I'm really not cutting anything. All I'm doing is cleaning. After I'm done, I'll take my rotary brush and I'll clean the fish away from the scales and try to pull out every bit. This would be running. I just want to show you the, the method I would use. And in light strokes, I would go over all of this to clean it up in preparation for sealing the fish. I want to thank you for the time we've just spent together here at my studio in Vermont. I hope you've enjoyed what has been presented as much as I've enjoyed demonstrating these machines, the accessories, and the techniques. If you've learned but one new bit of information that is helpful when you're carving, then the effort put into this video has been a success. Hopefully, it's provided a modicum of entertainment, but in large part, I hope it's provided information that will be helpful to you throughout any wood carving endeavor. Again, I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to wish you the best of carving, and for now, I'd just like to say goodbye. Congratulations, you just bought yourself a quality flexible shaft power tool. I'd like to take the time to explain a little bit about it, the common terms, how it's used, and the maintenance. But first things first. Let's take a look at a typical Fordham power tool kit. This is our general purpose 2272 kit. It comes with an owner's manual and CD or printed catalogs with information on all of our products. Our three wood carving kits also include fur, feathers, and fins, an instructional video on power carving with renowned carver Frank Russell. I can't recommend strongly enough that you read over the owner's manual before you begin using your new tool. And we advise that you keep it for future reference. But if you happen to lose it, all of our manuals can be downloaded from our website, www.fordham.com. Now let's go over the real meat and potatoes. Here's our foot pedal speed control motor, shaft and sheath, and handpiece. Let's take a look at the handpiece first. It's the part that you hold onto and the burrs and bits go into. It's attached to a long black flexible shaft, hence the name flexible shaft machine. This handpiece can be removed from the shaft by grabbing it like this and giving a good yank. It's as simple as that. 
I'll have more to say about attaching and removing hand pieces later. Next, we'll look at the shaft and sheath. You'll notice I said shaft and sheath, although he's only holding one item. It's really made of two components, an outer black rubber-like sheath that encloses and protects a metal inner shaft. This shaft looks like a tightly wound metal spring. The only part that you can see is this silver key tip. An important note here is that the tip should extend about three quarters of an inch from the end of the black sheath. If it's not quite right, we'll show you how to adjust it to the correct dimension shortly. As we go up the shaft and sheath, you'll come to what we call the motor connector. That's this light gray plastic cone. The motor connector is what holds the outer sheath to your motor housing and protects the inner shaft connection to the motor. All of our motor kits have hanging machines like this one. This thing here is called the motor bale. We also have bench mounted motors. These models come with a heavy duty cast iron metal basin yoke that swivels. The basin yoke are available separately for converting any hang up style motor into a bench model. When you look at the motor, you'll see that there are labels on the front and back that tell you lots of important information, including the model name, such as TX, SR, or L, the serial number, and specs like horsepower, max speed, voltage, and amps. Our motors also carry a basic warning label that everyone should follow, and that is to wear eye protection. Our newest motor, the 1.6 horsepower Series SR, has a forward, off, and reverse three-way toggle switch on the front. Please make sure that it's in the off position when setting up your motor and before plugging it in. This is a good time to review our other safety guidelines. Always wear proper safety glasses and a face shield for protection. Secure the workpiece that you are working on in a vise or other work holding device. Always use a proper dust collection system or wear a respirator. This will prevent the inhalation of dust particles, polishing compounds, or other debris. Don't wear loose fitting clothing or jewelry. These can get entangled in a rotating accessory. Always be sure to tie back or secure long hair. Secure the power tool to a motor hanger or to the work surface and never operate any accessory at speeds above its maximum rated speed. Never use an accessory that appears to be damaged, loose, vibrating, or out of balance. Always disconnect the power cord before servicing the motor or removing the shaft or sheath. Never operate the motor with the sheath removed and never change motor direction while the motor is running. Let me show you how we hang up our motors. This is one of our motor hangers. There's many different styles we have. Some clamp onto a desk, some you can put two on, some mount to a desk with bolts. They all come with these safety clips, which are very important. What you would do with the safety clip is you slide it on over the notch in your bale here, and you put it on like that. And what these do is they stop your motor from twisting and falling off when your motor starts up. Our motors have a lot of torque and they tend to jump and twist when you first start them up. And that's normal, it's a good thing, having lots of torque. Do a little planning before you set up your work area. If you're right-handed, you're going to want to mount your motor hanger on your right-hand side. If you're lefty, you're going to want to do it on your left-hand side. Now, the, what that does is it allows you to work freely and get good access to what you're doing without having your shaft cross in front of whatever you're doing. Also, you want to adjust your height of your motor hanger up or down like this. So that way what you do is you can have a very nice access and you're not putting too much of a strain on your shaft. You don't want to bend your shaft sharply and any place, uh, like here or here, those are no good. What you want is at least a four inch degree arc of radius in your shaft um, and nothing tighter than that. What that will do is if it's too tight, the bends like this, your shaft is rubbing on the inside and it's prematurely wearing the shaft and the sheath when the, the bend is too great, causing lots of heat. Now we can attach the motor to the speed control. More than likely, you have our FCT foot pedal speed control. It's the most popular. We have a metal version called the SCT, which is a little bit more expensive. Both controls have the same electronics inside, which, by the way, can be replaced if you ever have a problem. We also have a hand-operated dial speed control that other people prefer because it's easy to keep a set speed. That comes in handy for certain jobs that require steady speed especially at the low end. 
like when using our new chisel handpiece to carve in relief. Uncoil the cords of your motor and speed control. Notice that the control has a six foot long cord that goes to a standard wall outlet and a shorter cord that connects to the motor. Please take note that this is a three prong plug and should be used in a properly grounded electrical outlet. With the motor switch in the off position, plug the motor into the control. Now plug the control into your electrical outlet. Flip the motor switch to the forward position. While holding the handpiece in your hand, step on the foot pedal. Step gently. The foot pedal operates a lot like the accelerator in your car. The farther you press down, the faster you go. Most tools and accessories operate best at low to medium speeds. The bigger the accessory, the slower it should go. At this point, why don't we practice removing and reattaching the handpiece? To do that, just firmly grab the handpiece in one hand and the metal tip of your shaft and sheath in the other and give it a good firm yank. Don't worry, you're not going to break it. It's quite that simple. To put it back on, what you would do is, two, there's two methods. One of the methods that a lot of people like to use is slowly start spinning the shaft. Put your handpiece on very slowly. And the key tip will realign automatically into the keyway of the spindle. And when that happens, the chuck or your collet or your burr will start spinning slowly. When that happens, just firmly press it on and you're going to hear a click. That means that the ball and the, the spring clip have reattached onto the metal groove on your shaft. So you're ready to go. Give that a couple of practices till you feel comfortable. Now, if you're not that comfortable with doing that while it's running, you can do it another way. What you can do, is you look down the, your handpiece towards the keyway, and you'll see that there's a letter C. That gap in the C is the keyway slot in your spindle. Try and align that with the key tip and when that's ready, snap it on. Now that we've learned how to take your handpiece on and off, we're going to learn a little bit about changing out accessories in and out of your handpiece. What's an accessory? Well, let me tell you what an accessory is. Accessories are anything that goes into your handpiece and does the work. This is a variety. Fordham's got hundreds, thousands of different accessories. We've got our own accessory catalog. Um, accessories come in different sizes and shapes and different materials. They can be anything from a drill bit to a brush to a burr to a bob um, to a buff to a mandrel. This is our Typhoon. What you would do with that would be stick the shank, which is the end that goes into the handpiece, into your handpiece, and they come in different sizes. Um, we've got them in quarter inch, one eighth, three thirty second, one sixteenth. We also have metric sizes: six millimeter, three point two millimeter, two point three five millimeter. Those are all standard sizes that are used in many different industries. This is our number thirty handpiece. It's our most popular handpiece. It comes in our twenty two thirty jeweler's kit and our two two seven two general purpose kit. The reason it's so popular is it's very versatile. It has a three jaw chuck that opens up to five thirty seconds of an inch. In other words, when you change out your burrs, and I'm taking out a one eighth inch burr now and putting in a three thirty second, you can have a lot of different burrs in there. You can start to see here how it has three different jaws. It also has three different holes for tightening each jaw. And that's what you would want to do every time you tighten. These are the three jaws of the chuck type handpiece. Each jaw has got its own pinhole for the gears on the chuck key. And that's what you would want to use to tighten and loosen each one. This is our 44T. It's a collet style handpiece. It's the most popular handpiece in our wood carving line and the reason of that is it allows you to use the largest shank burrs, quarter inch, out of all of our hand pieces. Let me show you how to change out a burr and the collet. The reason you might want to change out a collet is because with the collet style hand pieces, the collets are specific to the size of the shank that you have. In other words, a quarter inch collet goes with a quarter inch shank burr. 
Let me show you how to do that. You need a pin and wrench, and you put the pin into the spindle to lock it, and the wrench on the flats of the chuck nut, and then you would spin that out. As you can see, this is your quarter inch burr. I'm going to change out the collet to a 332nd inch burr. This is a 332nd inch collet. Let me show you how we do that. It might take you a while to undo your chuck nut. What the chuck nut does is it screws down and tightens on the collet to tighten it in place. Now, let me show you the inside here. This is the collet, and I'm going to change out the quarter inch collet for a 332nd inch collet. Here's your quarter inch collet. Put the 332nd inch collet in. We put the chuck nut back on. Screw that down. Takes a little while. Get all the way down there and tight. Then you put in your accessory or burr. Put that in there all the way down. And then you tighten it up with the wrench on the flats. And it's tight. Always remember to take the pin out before you operate this hand piece because it locks the spindle and it won't be moving at all when you do that. Our 44T has been very popular. In fact, so popular, what we decided was we had people asking us for a shorter version to get into areas such as ski boots, tighter areas. So we made the 43T. This is a new hand piece. It takes the same collets as the 44T. The collets for the 44 and 43T go from 1 16th of an inch all the way on up to 1 quarter of an inch and we also have them in metric sizes up to 6 millimeters. We also have a thinner version of the 43T or number 28. The number 28 comes with the 44 and our deluxe wood carving kit, the 5200 kit. Since this is much more slender, it does not take large collets. The largest collet the 28 will take is our 1 8 inch collet. And it also takes collets on down to 1 16th of an inch. You change it out with a pin and wrench the same way you would do the 43 or the 44T. It's a nice hand piece, it's slimmer, and helps to reduce hand fatigue when you're doing very fine detailing work. While we're at wood carving, I wanted to show you our number 50 hand piece. This is a reciprocating handpiece. All the other handpieces I've shown you earlier are rotary. In other words, they spin like a drill would spin a drill bit. This actually has a hammer type action. We have over 22 different chisels that work with the number 50 handpiece. It's great for carving wood, styrofoam, and even soft stones such as soapstone and alabaster and pipestone. Another type of rotary handpiece is our quick change handpiece. It doesn't require any pin and wrench or chuck key to remove your accessory or burr or drill bit. The downside about that is is that it only accepts 2.35 millimeter or 332nd inch shank burrs. That's standard though in the jewelry industry and the dental laboratory industry so they find that it's very helpful. To change them you either move the lever, push pull, or uh, um, press a lever. There's many different methods. We have over four different types. This is our number 20. It's in our number 2220 kit. It's a very popular one. To remove this, you would move the lever up 90 degrees, pull the burr out, and exchange it for another one, and plop the lever back parallel to the handpiece. These are the three typical type of handpieces we have. You've got a collet style, a chuck style, and a quick change. None of these require any maintenance. They're all pre-lubricated. The only thing you really need to do is make sure that they keep the dirt and the dust out. If perchance you get a little grease in here, um, what you might want to do is take a Q-tip into the end where the shaft tip goes and wipe it out. This segment we're going to be doing maintenance on flex shafts. First thing you're going to want to do is unplug your unit and take the handpiece off. 
not rocket science. It's gonna be very easy. There's just very little to do. We'll go through every step. We're gonna start out with doing the maintenance on the shaft and sheath. Um, that's the most common, most often requiring to be done. Lay your motor out on a flat surface. Uh, a couple of tools you're gonna to need are at least a one inch crescent wrench or spanner, flathead screwdriver, some of our Fordham flex shaft grease, and a, a rag. And what you want to do then is unscrew the set screw on the motor connector, which loosens up the sheath. And you slide the sheath all the way off. What we're doing here is we're going to re-grease our shaft and sheath. It needs to be done every 40 hours of use. What you want to do is wipe it down. Every 200 hours, you're gonna really wanna clean it very good, and so you're gonna wanna use uh, rubbing alcohol or acetone or some other solvent. Then what you're gonna wanna do is after you wipe it off, is take your grease and put a very light coating on, maybe about a, I don't know, 1 16th of an inch bead down, all the way on down to say about, I don't know, five or six inches from the bottom. After the, you do that, you put your sheath back on. And slide that up. As you notice that there's a lot of play in between here. This is right where it bottoms out and you could all bottom it out right up to there. But of course, what'll happen then is you're gonna have too much of your sheath, shaft sticking out from your sheath tip. To adjust the shaft and sheath, you wanna adjust it so that you've got just about three quarters of an inch sticking out. And you do that by sliding this in and out here. And once you get the proper adjustment, you retighten down the set screw because that's what holds the sheath in adjustment to the shaft on the motor connector. After you're done, adjusting the shaft tip for its adjustment. What you're going to need to do is before you put the handpiece back on, you need to run your motor for about between 10 and 15 minutes at high speed. A lot of times what I'll tell people to do is put a trash can so that the shaft drips over it. What this will do is it'll heat up and rework and redistribute all the grease throughout all the way on down and any extra will drip out into your trash can and not into your handpiece. If grease gets in your handpiece it'll start making it overheat. Now what we're going to do is I will show you how to take off and replace the shaft. You take off the shaft using the one inch crescent wrench on your motor coupling here on the motor connector and what you do is it's a left-handed thread. It's so unlike the opposite one, the normal ones. So once you unscrew that you don't need to remove the sheath from the motor connector. Now that that's done, you can pull that off. And you'll see the motor coupling, the shaft coupling right here onto the motor shaft. You unscrew this, and off it comes. And as you can see that there's a flat area here on the motor shaft. It's on this flat that you want the set screw to set on your new inner shaft. When you put the new one on, you put that on all the way up tight and you just screw this in. Don't forget, you're gonna have to lubricate that new shaft just like I showed you a minute ago. Now slide your motor cup, motor connector and shaft assembly, sheath assembly on the shaft all the way on up. Rethread that on. Remember that it's a left-handed thread, not your standard right hand. Tighten it up. You're definitely going to want to make sure you've got the correct adjustment to three quarters of an inch of your inner shaft sticking out from the sheath. Motor maintenance is very easy. The primary uh, motor maintenance we have are replacing and checking the motor brushes. I bet you don't know what a motor brush is. Motor brush, we have two of them in every motor. One on each side, one here, and one on the other side. 
and I'll show you what they look like. What they do is they transfer the electricity from the plug to the inside of the motor that spins, the commutator. Take off the motor brush cap here with a regular flathead screwdriver. The motor brush just pops out. That's a motor brush. This little carbon thing here wears down. When it's brand new, it's about three quarters of an inch long. When it gets to one quarter of an inch or lower, you need to replace it. And it's best to replace both of them at the same time, whether the other one needs it or not. The other motor maintenance that you have to do is blowing out with like compressed air in a little dust container here or with your air compressor. Um, dust that gets into the motor here. Just a quick will all do it. Uh, you get sawdust and other types of dust, metal dust in there and it will short out the motor. So you might want to do that once a month. Every 40 hours of use is a good rule of thumb. I'd like to introduce our TX motor. It's a one-third horsepower motor. Our SR was a one-sixth. That was a universal type motor. This is a permanent magnet motor. Uh, it requires DC juice to come in and that's provided by the foot pedal and the other speed controls which we'll go over in a minute. Now earlier we went over the motor hanger and the, the spring clip here and why that's so important is because these motors with heavy duty torque like the SR and the TX tend to twist a little bit when you start them up and this spring clip helps them to stay on the motor hanger and not jump off as you'll see when we turn that on. This is a great motor, it takes the same shaft and sheath that you have with your SR motor and the same hand pieces. It goes on the same, the maintenance is just about the same. The major difference that I said was in that it's a DC motor, permanent magnet, and with that you'd have the special foot controls. This is the TXR. It looks a lot like the FCT that you get with the SR, except this has got special electronics in it. They change the current AC current coming from your wall to DC. That's what's required by the motor. We also have the dial controls and the metal foot pedals, just like you do with the other units. These speed controls have special shielded plugs, so that way you can't mistakenly plug in a regular control that does not have the electronics that switch out the AC to DC current required by the motor. It's very important that you use these or you will blow the motor when you plug them into an AC outlet. And just plug in like that and just go. This motor has a speed range of about 500 RPM to 15,000 RPM and it's great at low speeds that require a lot of power for heavy hogging out of wood or other industrial applications that you really need a lot of power at low speeds. This concludes our little mini DVD on Ford and Basics. I hope that you've learned a little bit. Um, it's a great tool. It should last you many, many years. We've been in business for since 1922. Uh, all of our motors have a two-year warranty. If you have any questions, you can give us a call or you can look us up on our website, www.fordham.com.